coming up today on Real Life. In the practice that day, she said to me, your baby must not have any kidneys, your baby must not have a bladder, half your amniotic fluid is gone. There must be something chromosomally wrong with your baby. You need to have an abortion. You could die and your baby most certainly will die. Uh, they were wrong that they gave us the t wrong test results and that your baby has uh, trisomy 21. My dad was questioning me, asking if I was feeling okay. And that day, he took me to a pregnancy support center. I got an ultrasound, and I heard the heartbeat. Just once hearing that, everything changed from there. He said to me, I've had a lot of people sit in that chair you're sitting in now and regret their abortions. She said, but not once have I ever met a single mother who has ever regretted having their baby. Feeling lots of, what am I gonna do? So many things whirling through my head, and then, after a month. Hi, I'm Monica, and I'm glad you could join us today for Real Life. On Real Life, we open up conversation about life, relationships, and the choices surrounding pregnancy. Up first, you'll meet a couple, Suzanne and Peter, and they will share their story of their long-awaited and much-anticipated first pregnancy. The response that they got from the medical community surprised them. Hear about their story now. We really thought that we would have children right away once we got married, but as the years went on, um, that was just not happening, and it was devastating. It was challenging, uh, but over time, we finally were able to conceive, and we were thrilled. When I saw that little line, there are no words to describe it. Fast forward to my 22-week ultrasound. So I'm lying on the table and the tech is, you know, moving the little ultrasound wand around with a gel on my stomach. And she very politely says to me, um, I need to excuse myself and go get a doctor. And a doctor in the practice that day, she said to me, your baby must not have any kidneys, your baby must not have a bladder, half your amniotic fluid is gone. There must be something chromosomally wrong with your baby. You need to have an abortion. You could die and your baby most certainly will die. That was jarring. Uh, that was a life-changing moment. Of course, we loved our child and we wanted to know what hopeful steps we were going to be given next or some direction. That doctor sent us up to another doctor and this actually was even more disturbing because this doctor that my husband and I sat across from, he was very calm and collected. He said, you, you clearly need to have an abortion. You'll have many other children. And I so vividly remember saying, I don't care if we have a hundred other children. This life matters, and we want this life. And he said, but you don't understand. Your child probably won't even live. Your child clearly has a chromosomal abnormality that is not compatible with life. There's no way that this child would live. And if for some reason this child did live, this child would have no quality of life. And finally, as we were getting toward the end of the conversation, my husband said, clearly, we are not going to abort. So what will you do for us? What can we expect? And he said the most chilling words. He said, in my seven years of practice, nobody in your position has ever not aborted. We asked him if there were other tests he could do. He said, the only other test I could offer you is an autopsy report. And he went on to say, go home and wait for your baby to die. And when you come back in for one of your visits, there will no longer be a heartbeat and you will give birth to a stillborn child. At which point, my wonderful husband and I went home. 
devastated. Devastated, honestly. Wanting to shut ourselves away from the world and just devastated. And my amazing mom, she said, Suzanne, is there still a heartbeat? And I said, well, yes. She said, Suzanne, if there's a heartbeat, there is hope. We reached out to a doctor at our church. And he said, we'll honor your request to fight for your baby's life. And immediately they put me on bed rest. And uh, we were rushed into the operating room and it was an emergency C-section. And they said, because there's no amniotic fluid, if by chance she is alive, she will be too weak to cry. And there was a, a drape. My husband could see on the other side, I couldn't. And then I remember seeing Rachel come up out, up over the top of that sheet, and she was very tiny. I all of a sudden heard him say, she's squawking. And the doctors were joking because they said, She's so feisty and willful, she kept sticking her hands up trying to grab the doctor's stethoscope. And they thought she would be too weak to cry, they thought she would be too weak to move. It was something I'll never forget, and you can't really put words to it either. All I kept thinking was, she's alive. She's alive. God says, I knit you together uh, in your mother's womb. So God knew her before we did and had value in her. And if we didn't know God or that verse, I can't imagine how that would have changed our perspectives. My name is Rachel Mary. And if my parents wouldn't have fought for me, I would have missed out on a life that is such a joy. We are grateful for live action and their ministry and allowing us to use this video. For more information, go to liveaction.org or call 323-454-3304. If there is a heartbeat, there is hope, and that holds true for all of us. Regardless of the choices we've made or what's in our past, there is always hope in Jesus Christ. Right now, if you are facing an unintended pregnancy and you don't know what to do, we encourage you to call the helpline. The information is on the screen and they are open 24-7. Up next on Real Life, meet Courtney. We had gotten uh, a phone call from our nurse and she said, uh, the test came back, everything's fine, the baby's healthy. We had a sonogram the next morning. We went in there, you know, thinking everything was great. We were just gonna get to see the baby moving around and, um, you know, see all the fingers and, and toes. And um, so we waited about 45 minutes and uh, Matt and I were both like, what's going on? You know, there's, we've never had to wait this long. So um, after a while, the doctor came to the door and called our name and it was the doctor with the nurse. I'd never seen the doctor before. So we were both just like, what's going on? I remember walking back that hallway and uh, thinking, I actually said to him, I said, you're scaring me, I, what's going on? Um, so we went into this little room and I remember that um, I sat down and the nurse was holding a box of tissues and it's kind of when you, you know something's going on. And, um, he said that uh, they were wrong that they gave us the t wrong test results and that your baby has uh, trisomy 21. I just remember looking at those Kleenexes thinking I'm not gonna cry. I'm not going to let them think that this is going to destroy me because it will not. And the doctor said, we really want you to go see a specialist uh, to discuss your options. And. I said, I don't know what you mean by options, but if you mean abortion, there's no um, discussing that. And so we are going to keep our baby. 
When we found out the diagnosis, um, I went into depression for about six weeks where I was just couldn't even get off the couch. I felt like my life was over. I felt like uh, I, was, I was okay if I didn't live to see the next day. It was not um, healthy, obviously, and I don't know that it's necessarily normal, but that's where I was. And I ended up leaving that OB and uh, trying to go someplace else. Since I was high risk, nobody would take me. So we ended up going to the specialist mainly because we um, didn't have anywhere else to go. We didn't have another doctor. The first thing he did was say, you chose not to terminate, and we want to just make sure that you don't want to talk to somebody else about that. And we said, no, we've already named our child. This is Emerson. And um, after that, uh, it, it came up again and again to a point where we felt, I think the only way I can describe how we felt was bullied. Every time he gave us bad news, it was like he did it with glee. It was so bizarre that we would leave there dumbfounded and I remember the last time we went um, he told us that she had club feet and he he like giggled that was it we weren't going back I didn't know anybody with Down syndrome I had only been hearing the negative about Downs and what they wouldn't do and what she wouldn't accomplish and I went through my entire pregnancy just in grief and sorrow and I had my faith it definitely is the only thing that kept me going. Um, I knew that he was gonna bring beauty from the ashes, I knew it, but being in that for the entire pregnancy, I was terrified to have her. I was terrified to give birth to her. I was terrified to look at her. I didn't know, you know what she would look like. I didn't know if I was gonna be able to love her. When they brought her to me, it was about two o'clock in the morning and I was holding her and she smiled and um, I remember thinking, this this baby is so easy to love. And she's just, she's just, I knew everything was gonna be okay. And I felt like that was God's gift to me. Like this is just beginning and it's gonna be the best journey. I don't want a world without children with Down syndrome. I don't want us to go down that road that other countries are going to. They're missing it, and um, that's a tragedy. You can't say to somebody that they're going to have a poor quality of life, or their child's gonna have a poor quality of life, when nearly 100% of people surveyed with Down syndrome and their families say their quality of life has gotten better. They have to be truthful, and they have to bring out the, the positives because there are so many more positives than negatives. The perfect doctor to me would have been I understand that this is very difficult for you, but let me tell you what I know from, from other mothers who have gone through this. In fact, here's a place where you can go to get support. That would have been wonderful. When I did get together with DSDN and all the other rockin' mamas out there, I saw what she could do. And I know she can, she can drive if she wants to. She can um, go to college if she wants to. She can get married if she wants to. There's so much more out there that she can do than that she can't do. And that's really what our goal is for her, is to just continue to not meet expectations, but defy them, just go so far past that um, she is an example to others. She is an inspiration to others. I think the proof that people are more than their diagnosis is my daughter. My Emerson is so much more than we were told she was gonna be more than my highest expectations, uh, more than my greatest dreams. I'm thankful for the opportunity to have learned so much from her. We are grateful for Live Action and their ministry and allowing us to use this video. For more information, go to liveaction.org or call 323-454-3304. As you watched Courtney's story, you may have thought, I wish I had that kind of faith when the medical community was encouraging me to abort. If that's the case, and right now you're living with guilt or shame, we want you to know that the helpline is there for you 24 seven. They will help you get the resources, the tools that you need to move past the guilt and to walk in the wholeness that Jesus Christ has for your life. Up next, you'll meet a young woman who discovered that she was pregnant when she was just 17. You'll hear her story of how her whole family came around her and helped her make a good choice.
When I first found out that Taylor was pregnant, um, it was very surreal, but I knew what we had to do um, it was gonna be a huge decision. I really wanted to be there for her. I'm young myself, so mm -hmm. I think that was the first thought that, you know, this is it's too soon to have a child. My first decision was maybe to abort at a very early stage, even though it was definitely against what my beliefs and religion. Um, it was a very selfish thought that came across, but, um, and, but ultimately it was gonna be Taylor's choice. So I found out I was pregnant my junior year of high school and my first thought that came to mind was abortion. For Thanksgiving, I decided to visit my grandparents in Florida. I could tell that they weren't really pushing towards abortion. I knew that they just believed that God had a different plan. In the beginning, when she came to stay with me in November, at that point, her decision was she was gonna have an abortion December 3rd. And we talked to her about what do you believe about abortion? Mm -hmm. And she didn't believe in it, but for her at that point, as a 17 year old, it was a solution that she only could think of that would take everything away. Mm -hmm. And so I came back home to North Carolina and that day I got off the plane. My dad was questioning me, asking if I was feeling okay. And that day he took me to a pregnancy support center. I got an ultrasound and I heard the heartbeat. Just once hearing that, everything changed from there. My grandma had contacted my dad and had found Nightlight Christian Adoptions. And from there, it was just like, it was all God. Laura from the adoption agency drove to Black Mountain and we met at a coffee shop and got to know each other and, and so I thought I'd give it a shot. And so I went to Greenville with my mom to look at portfolio books of the different families and I wanted to go home. I wasn't making any connections. I just started even thinking about, okay, I should just keep this baby because there's no hope. We were watching this video of a family and this weird ringtone went off. And so we continued watching a video and then it went off again. And I guess Laura had had the on-call birth mother phone to the adoption agency and someone had sent in two videos that they wanted me to watch. And then the second video was the Hunstables. And from then on, it changed everything. My mom and I went home and shared with the family like the link and went crazy and like I think I watched that video constant. It was on repeat when I went to bed. They came to visit me in North Carolina. They came to my doctor's appointment. It was just like we've known them all of our lives. But from the very first time we met Taylor, she was, it was just felt right. I mean, she was immediately part of our family. We could, you could just tell, you could feel it. I know that a lot of people question um, if you've had a, a biological child, you know, will they love this adopted child as much? And, um, but after meeting her and we've had a week to fall in love and it's no different. I mean, <laughs> we feel the same, just overwhelming joy and just completely like, she was meant to be ours. It's just a different route. She didn't grow in my tummy. She grew in my heart. And she's just the most precious gift. Due to her small measurements, they wanted me having her at 39 weeks. And so they set a date. June 8th was the big day. They wanted to start the induction at 8 a.m. And, and so the Huntstables arrived a few days ahead. It was like we already knew them. And so I arrived at the hospital and I remember I constantly wanted Holly in the room. Of course I wanted my mom, but I just remember if anyone I wanted Holly. It got to be about 12 a.m. and I was ready to start pushing. It was just so peaceful. And I think I pushed for about 40 minutes and she arrived. Seeing her for the first time was mind blowing. And I wanted Holly holding Journey first 
So my doctor set Journey on Holly's chest. And it was so cool because my umbilical cord was still attached to me. But at the same time, Holly was holding Journey. So it was just like, in a way, a connection that I can't even describe. And it made me realize that adoption was the right decision. All along, it was God's plan and he mapped out every single piece. I think it's been an amazing experience meeting the family, um, being able to be so open. Um, they're a great family. And I just feel like we're never gonna lose connection and for a lifetime, they're going to be there. We'd like to give a special thanks to Nightline Christian Adoptions for their ministry and allowing us to use this video. For more information, go to nightlight.org or call 502-423-5780. When it comes to an unplanned or a crisis pregnancy, there are many options available. And sometimes those options can feel overwhelming. There can be pressure to an abort. There can be fear about what to do next. And that's why it's good sometimes to pause, to take a step back and to reach out for help. We have a helpline available to you 24 seven, and we encourage you to reach out and allow them to help you know your options and make a decision that's best for you. Well, I was 16 when I first became pregnant. I didn't really believe it was real still. You know, you're kind of, ha ha, this is funny, good joke. But then I went into the doctor's office to get my official, yes, you are for sure pregnant. She did my pregnancy test and she said, you're right, you're pregnant. And so that was when the tears kind of came flooding in and the emotions suddenly were just like heightened. I knew I had three options, basically one to become a parent, two to have an abortion, and three to put the baby up for adoption. She said to me, I've had a lot of people sit in that chair you're sitting in now and regret their abortions. She said, but not once have I ever met a single mother who has ever regretted having their baby. Feeling lots of, what am I going to do? So many things whirling through my head and then... After a month, I kind of thought, felt, oh, okay, well, maybe I'm not meant to have this baby. You know, things aren't really working out. And so, because they just tell you that it's a blob of cells and that it's just, you know, you're not doing anything. It doesn't hurt the baby, but the heartbeat starts at 21 days. Brainwaves start 45 days. And before you even find out you're pregnant, the baby is definitely living and definitely functioning as a human. I, I know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I know that he is in my life right now because he needs to be, and God wanted him to be on this earth. It's pretty amazing that you could just love someone so little so much. I just can't imagine not having him here with me today. and what I would be doing if he wasn't in my life right now. I think I'd be very lost and wondering <laughs> this November, where was my baby? <laughs> life is a beautiful gift. I think that we can never take it for granted or put ourselves in a position where we can be the controllers of life. Because okay? honestly, you know, look at how precious that is. You're just too cute for words, hey? <laughs> Choose life. You're never gonna regret it. Today on Real Life, we've talked about hope. And the honest truth is that because of Jesus Christ, there is hope for all of us. So I'm gonna take just a moment to pray for you, that you will know the hope that God wants us to know and that we can all find by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Father, I come to you right now in Jesus' name. I lift up every person that's watching. 
And Father, for each one that's discouraged or feels hopeless, I pray right now that he or she would come to know the hope that is available through your son, Jesus Christ, and will experience the power of your unconditional love and your mercies, Father. I pray that over each one in Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you could join us today on Real Life. We'll see you again next week. If you would like to share your abortion-related story, please contact us through our website, www.reallifetv.life, or through our Facebook page at Real Life CTN. If you need help in dealing with either an unplanned pregnancy or regret from a past abortion, please contact the H3 Helpline at 866-721-7881. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Thank you.